Hey guys, today we're talking about existence as having primacy over consciousness in Leonard Peikoff's book, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. Stay tuned. Hey guys, today we're talking about the primacy of existence, and let's dive right in with a summary of what Leonard covers in this chapter. We start out with how a child would initially grasp the implicit concept of consciousness, and then go on to articulate the way in which implicit in grasping that consciousness is conscious, we grasp a certain relationship between consciousness and existence, namely that existence has primacy. And this is to be contrasted with the theory that consciousness has primacy over existence. And we get some explanation of what these mean. Now, like all axioms and their corollaries, it, the primacy of existence is inescapable. That is, even denying it, you are forced to affirm it. Then we get the epistemological, or some of the epistemological implications of the primacy of existence, namely the fact that you have to gain knowledge in a fundamental sense of reality by extrospection, by looking outward, not from any form of looking inward, at looking at your feelings, your intuitions, at you know any kind of internal structures or revelations. It has to come fundamentally from looking out at reality. Finally, we get that there's three variants of the primacy of consciousness, the supernatural, the social, the personal, but all of them are refuted ultimately by the same basic recognition of reality that existence exists. Now, I want to start off actually by uh, referencing a question I got in regards to the axiom of consciousness, because I think it sets this up really well. Now, remember, what Leonard is doing in introducing this section is very similar to causality. We go through the chronological development of axiomatic concepts. So with causality, as you'll recall, first we get existence, and then there's a grasp of entity. And then that, lead, that makes possible a grasp of the axiomatic concept of identity. Then we notice their characteristics and specifically get the axiomatic concept of action, which allows us to reach through perception the law of causality, the law of identity applied to action. Now, Leonard says, once we've gotten to that stage, we can start, we can ultimately reach the concept of consciousness of our awareness and we do and i'll talk a little bit about how we do that and so the question is you know once we've reached that point like what do we know what are the implications of that and that gets us to the question so here's the question and let me set it up by reminding you of ayn rand's statement that uh this really flows out of so ayn rand's quote is if nothing exists there can be no consciousness a consciousness with nothing to be conscious of is a contradiction in terms Quick aside here before I go on with the quote, most philosophers would agree with that. And so if you take somebody like Descartes, he would agree that a consciousness with nothing to be conscious, uh, conscious of would be a contradiction in terms. But what Descartes is going to go on to say is, well, but what conscious is conscious of, I think therefore I am, is itself, is its own thinking processes. That the object of awareness exists, but it is conscious. It's it, it, What you're aware of is, the, uh, is consciousness itself. So then we get to Ayn Rand's second point. A consciousness conscious of nothing but itself is a contradiction in terms. Before it could identify itself as consciousness, it had to be conscious of something. If that which you claim to perceive does not exist, what you possess is not consciousness. So now let's get to Tim's question. Tim asks, I'm trying to understand how to get to the truth of this statement. Is it because of the nature of consciousness? It's self-evident that I am aware I am thinking of things, so I am aware of my consciousness, but is there something about having to be aware of things that aren't my consciousness in order to know I am conscious? I don't quite see the glaring contradiction. Perhaps it's just me. In his lectures on the foundations of knowledge, Harry Binswinger gives what I think is a really great answer to this type of question, and, he's, and he basically narrows it and says, well, let's take one form of awareness, one, one mode of awareness, sight. And it's a person who says, I see. What do you see? Nothing. I just see. Or if you build on that and say, well, I see my seeing. Like, it's, it doesn't make any sense. The, the basic point is that awareness is awareness of an object. It is awareness of something. And only then can you go back and grasp, oh, okay, there's something of which I'm aware. So it starts with awareness of, uh, of an object apart from consciousness because consciousness, 
consciousness is just awareness. Even if you take something like if you try to like put your head in what Descartes could possibly be talking about and project it, like words running through, you know, a black ether or something, those words, the, like words are percepts. They're things that we look at that um, stand for ideas, but there is no words, whether on a page or the verbalizations in our brains, that is all derivative of external reality, let alone the meaning of words. So there's no consciousness, there's no thinking, there's, there's no awareness before there's awareness of an object. And that's Ayn Rand's point. Ayn Rand's point is that you couldn't even get consciousness until you have consciousness of something. The something it is, is the starting point. To make this even clearer, let's go through the kind of process that Leonard indicates in terms of the actual way in which a child would implicitly grasp consciousness. So you need this starting context. You need to have grasped these earlier uh, concepts. Specifically, you'd have to grasp identity and causality because what you're grasping when you grasp consciousness is there's a process that, by which I'm aware that your awareness is produced by a certain means. And so you have to have the idea of existence, identity, causality in order to even get to this stage. And so what you're doing when you're grasping consciousness is over time you're going through a process where you're distinguishing between my awareness and my non-awareness and existence and non-existence and getting that those are two different things. So you know, you take the child and it's that um, they are hearing their mama talk and seeing their mama talk and when they close their eyes they can still hear the talking or it's that they're holding the spoon and they see it and they feel it and they throw it to the ground and they can still see it even though they can't feel it or it's that you know you're turning around and it's not that the room is just suddenly popping into existence it's that oh no now i'm seeing it um it's you know you're hearing your sister talking you're closing your ears and you know you can still see her talking it's that you have these contrasts where you're getting, oh, I'm aware by a certain process, and then it's my awareness isn't changing the object of what I'm perceiving. My awareness is just awareness. It's just grasping what's going on in reality. It's not creating it. And this is Leonard's point about in grasping consciousness, you grasp it as having a certain identity, as having an identity as a process of awareness, not a process of creation, not a process of controlling reality, the process of coming into awareness of objects that exist independently of consciousness. Okay, so let's formulate then the primacy of existence. It is the idea that existence comes first, that metaphysically it's primary. Consciousness is dependent on it in the sense of you can have existence without consciousness, but you can have consciousness without existence. Um, but then it's that Consciousness is just awareness of existence. Again, it's not control, it's not shaping. It is metaphysically passive, just grasping what is. The, so the primacy of existence is an integration then of identity and consciousness and saying consciousness is conscious. Awareness is awareness and it is only awareness. You can think of it this way, that in grasping existence, you grasp that existence is identity and that the identity of consciousness is to grasp the identities of that which exists. And so the way that Ayn Rand puts this is existence is identity, consciousness is identification. So we can pull out two epistemological implications of this. So first is that existence is the starting point. It's what we grasp first versus the what Ayn Rand calls the prior certainty of consciousness. And this is the Descartes idea, right? It versus the idea that we could that first we grasp that we're aware and then it's oh it turns out we're aware of something no it's that first you're aware and it's only then that you can grasp that you're aware of something so there's no special problem of all right we have consciousness how do we reason our way to existence and we grasp existence and then only then we're able to grasp consciousness the second is that be, that therefore not what is knowledge knowledge is your consciousness conforming to existence, grasping existence, grasping reality. It is not reality conforming to consciousness. And so you can think of uh, the example that Ankar Gatte once gave that I found really helpful was it's Galileo versus the church, right? Galileo is saying like, 
No, look, this is the way that reality actually operates. And the church saying, no, reality is to conform to the Bible. It has to conform to revelation. It's the looking inward is the standard of knowledge, not the looking outward. Now, here's a crucial clarification, because we're stressing the kind of metaphysical passivity of consciousness and saying that consciousness doesn't create. All of its material ultimately comes from reality, from what we perceive. Um, and any creation is just rearranging mentally what happens in consciousness. But this idea of consciousness as passive is not being able to change, influence, control reality. You could think, well, but like, look, consciousness is how we are making decisions and moving things around and impacting reality all the time. And the issue is this, that when we're looking at consciousness as a faculty it, and grasping as the faculty of a biological organism, it, crucially, it's involved in guiding our actions through existence. What we're talking about when we're talking about the primacy of existence this is consciousness as awareness. And it's, it's qua awareness. It's in terms of what it means to be aware of something is to grasp what is. That's not to create or control what is. So it's two different perspectives. Consciousness as a faculty and consciousness as a state of awareness. And as a state of awareness, it is awareness. That's the crucial issue. So I want to say something about the primacy of existence as self-evident. It is implicit in our grasp of the axioms. It's not something we prove. And indeed, the only reason we need to prove things is because there's an independent existence that we have to conform to and that we as conceptual beings can depart from. The whole perspective of proof is, that, is precisely that there's facts independent of consciousness. And like any axiom or corollary of axioms, uh, the primacy of existence is inescapable. And so even in the attempt to deny it, you have to affirm it. And we can see this very eloquently when we look at Kant, because Kant's basic claim is that our mind is cut off. We cannot perceive reality as it really is, only as it appears to us. But, and philosophers have pointed this out, like this was a known problem. Um, that is not a statement about consciousness. That's supposed to be a statement of what's true, what's real, independent of consciousness. Kant is standing outside his own theory in order to say that everybody else, in effect, is trapped in their own consciousness. And this is true of every form of the primacy of consciousness, is that you are it, you have to exempt your own theory yourself from your own theory in order to even try to put it over. And so you're affirming the very position you're trying to deny. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about just very briefly, or I'll indicate um, the reason why people can grasp that this is a real problem for the theory and then continue to hold on to the primacy of consciousness. Uh, so at the risk of this becoming repetitive, I find it helpful to ask, like, what what is primacy of existence adding over and above the axioms? Like, why is this an issue worth pointing out and emphasizing um, that distinguishes it from just saying existence exists, consciousness is conscious, uh, A is A? And the basic issue, I think, is that really the core question in philosophy is what is the relationship between existence and consciousness? And this is giving us the fundamental metaphysical relationship between existence and consciousness, that it's it, existence comes first and consciousness has to conform to it. But why is this so important to underscore? And there's two ways to look at it. One is from the perspective of sort of in developing a system of philosophy, what happens if you get this wrong? And then we can look at it more personal terms of what happens to an individual when they get this wrong. So if we look at when a system get this, gets this wrong, this is really the fundamental place in which a philosophy goes off the rails. And Leonard gives three kind of categories of the primacy of existence that cover, I mean, really kind of a monumental number of philosophic or, uh, as we'll see, religious theories. And that is the supernatural version of primacy of consciousness, the social version and the personal version. And so if you just think about like wh what we're including under here when we're saying the primacy of consciousness is wrong and it sends you off the rails, it, this is really the fundamental grounds in which we reject all religious views, every other form of supernaturalism. And then, I mean, it's, it gets why, you know, Descartes wrong, why Kant is wrong, why Hegel's wrong. It's dismissing the, a 
whole raft of views by grasping that they've gone off the rails at the very start of philosophy. Now, by contrast, if you get the primacy of existence right and you try to hold on to it, then, I mean, you can make errors, but you're, you're not going to go wrong in any major way. But there's a caveat here, which is that to actually implement the primacy of existence throughout a philosophic system, there's two big problems that you have to be able to address. And this is really where um, theory, this really explains why even when people would see the sort of incoherence and primacy of existence views, they ultimately held on to them. So one is that like consciousness is a process. It's an active process of awareness. It has a certain identity that contributes to our ability to be aware. And what, what we'll see later in uh, our discussions is the way in which the identity of consciousness is seen as a disqualifier. That is, if consciousness contributes to the process of awareness, then what we're aware of is distorted or what we're aware of does not exist, that we're cut off from reality because of the identity of consciousness. So you have to be able to deal with that issue. And then second, in order to maintain the primacy of consciousness, you have to be able to get the right relationship between concepts and percepts and that of course is you know a monumental challenge that Ayn Rand is going to take up and will take up when we get to chapter three so that when you watch for those so we'll get the identity of consciousness in chapter two we'll get the relationship of concepts and percepts in chapter three and that is really going to be key to Ayn Rand's ability to consistently implement the primacy of existence throughout her philosophy. Now, we're always looking for the cash value of these ideas and relate it to how does this issue come up in real life. And the basic issue, I think, is that consciousness can deviate, at least at the conceptual level, as we'll see, from existence. That you can have a clash between the I want and the it is, or the I wish and the it is. And what the primacy of existence is drawing our attention to is that it's that in that conflict, you have to resolve it in favor of existence. That is the uh that is our consciousness that needs to conform to existence not the other way around and so um ayn Rand has this line that i might be butchering a little bit but it's you know like in effect the wrong view is saying i want it therefore it is and the right view is saying it is therefore i want it and that's really what we have to cultivate and what this principle helps us cultivate in our own lives is that what we're never going to allow ourselves to place an I want or an I wish over an it is. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about how this issue actually comes up. So I've said that it shapes philosophies and systems of philosophy and that it's um, relevant to our lives anytime we have a clash between an I want and an it is. But one of the really interesting things I found was that I was uh, having trouble scraping up a lot of examples when I thought, well, where do I actually see going through life, the primacy of existence versus the primacy of consciousness? And that should be a big red flag. Uh, in his courses on objectivism through induction, Leonard stresses the way in which an idea, that a, a philosophic idea that you really hold, you should be flooded with examples. And if we're talking about a philosophic principle, it's supposed to be integrating a lot of other knowledge. And so if all you have for primacy of existence is, well, I guess there's, you know, praying and Christianity and Kant, you don't yet really grasp the principle. You don't yet have it as part of your way of looking at the universe. So I spent, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes just sitting down saying, all right, well, where do I actually see this? And I highly recommend taking some time to do this with all the principles, wherever you feel as if like, Basically, all I have is the content is what Leonard or Ayn Rand says and maybe a handful of examples they use for illustration. Um, if we're talking about a philosophic principle, you really want to be able to see it everywhere. So, um, I, I mean, I encourage going through uh, Leonard's course, Objectivism Through Induction, but even just at a basic level, just sitting down saying, what are some examples of this I see, will give you a lot more clarity, will make these ideas a lot more uh, clear and valuable to you. So here's just some of the stuff that I came up with as I was thinking about this. So this whole idea of lived experience, which is we can't communicate it about an external world because all of our ideas are really conforming to our status as oppressors or oppressed. Um, any version of what will people think as if the fundamental question, you can see that as a, a 
perspective on the virtue of independence versus dependence. But the deepest perspective, I think, is that it's, are we supposed to conform to reality or to other consciousnesses? Now, this next one is probably more when we get to the next section, but I think it's still, it still works here, which is any form of like reality is unfair. So like it is unfair that COVID has come and is threatened us and disrupted our lives. I think that's basically saying like reality is supposed to conform to what we want, whereas no, what we want and how we live has to conform to reality. Here's one, uh, the book, The Secret, which holds this law of attraction, which says that you can attract all the things you want in the universe by the sheer act of thinking, that it's not thinking, then planning, then acting that is going to bring you what you want. It's just the sheer act of walking around and saying, I want to be, you know, I want a million dollars or, you know, I want a fancy car. I mean, this is like the, you know, a ridiculously primitive form of the primacy of consciousness. But I mean, the thing sold a gazillion copies. So uh, it definitely had some traction. Here's another one um, that I think is less obvious, but still uh, to me really illustrates this principle, which is the idea that healthcare is a right. So if you're on the primacy of existence, you start with, okay, what is, and so it's like, what, it, what does reality actually give us? And it doesn't give us healthcare. It's something that we have to produce. And so we want to think, all right, well, what are the conditions necessary in order for people to produce healthcare? And then ultimately you get a perspective on freedom. But I think the a lot of the view that healthcare is a right is not some articulated argument for that. It's basically, well, I want everybody to have health care, and so reality needs to conform to it. And since they can't actually, in fact, make reality conform to it, they're going to make other men bring it into reality. But it's ultimately this this perspective that reality must bend to consciousness, not us conform to existence. There's any of a thousand cases of not bringing up an embarrassing or a painful fact as if like that will make it go away i think ultimately is this idea of that our awareness of it would make that fact real and if we don't acknowledge it that fact is unreal so it's not taking seriously that existence exists and we have to conform to it it's that um, reality is going to bend or be shaped by our consciousness and finally ayn rand's novels are replete with examples of this and you can just take the example of you know james taggart um lusting after trying to enjoy the fact of like cheryl crediting him with creating the john galt line as if her belief her sheer belief makes it real that he had that achievement and the virtues that made that achievement possible so again these are just a handful of examples and as i and i think one reason it can sometimes be hard uh, or I'll just speak for myself. One reason why I think I struggled with this is that there's a lot of examples um, that are not clearly under the primacy of existence versus what we're going to talk about next time, which is the distinction between uh, the metaphysically given and the man-made. That there's that once we bring that one that what we're going to do next time is look at the way we're going to bring now explicitly not just consciousness in its relationship to existence but free will in its relationship to existence. And so a lot of the examples where people uh, fall into the primacy of consciousness is not these obvious ways of thinking that like, if I just sit here and wish I'm going to have a million dollars, that it's much more um, remote, non-obvious ways. And I think it's precisely mostly through this issue of free will that uh and and confusing or blending or reversing the metaphysically given and man-made in the relationship between the two um that we actually engage or fall into or see the primacy of consciousness come up so we'll talk about that next time in the meantime if you like this make sure to like the video on youtube and subscribe to the youtube channel as always the best way to stay in contact is to go to donswriting.com and sign up for the newsletter I will talk to you next time when we'll be dealing with our final topic in chapter one. And uh, just a quick word about that. I'm almost certainly not going to do the final section, which is a polemical section. I might do some of the polemical sections in this book, but uh, in that section where it covers idealism versus materialism. And these basically are uh, contrasting philosophic views, but I am not steeped enough in the different thinkers 
to really give you a firsthand account. And what I don't want to be doing here is just basically parroting things that I personally don't understand. So I'll bring in specific philosophers when I know enough about them to do so. But something like idealism, which is really getting the Kantian philosophy and the, and the post-Kantian philosophy, especially uh, materialism, which is getting to the more philosophic sections of Marx, at best, I have some vague knowledge of kind of secondary literature on most of those people. And so I think it'd be unfair and it's really unnecessary for our purposes to delve in deeply. But I did just at least want to acknowledge that that section of uh, OPAR exists. And again, there are probably some polemical sections. I'll have some things I want to say uh, on, but I, I, I'm not going to do a video where it'll basically, you're, the only thing you'll get is me repeating what Leonard said or trying to like scrounge up, you know, some like Wikipedia level research on these philosophers. So with that, talk to you next time.